So why am I wearing a turban? What's a Haven Kund? It was all new to me too. Let's go into how we built this project that was special to me because it was an honor to be asked to do it. So a Haven Kund is a small offering pit or, or a place to burn incense and other things during Hindu celebrations and ceremonies. And a family member of mine was marrying a girl whose parents were from India and they wanted to have a traditional piece like they'd find back home in the center of the ceremony. It's really dead center during the whole ceremony. And online here, you don't find anything. They're all little bowls that are stamped. It just, you know, it didn't have the presence that they were looking for and they wanted something more like what they would have seen back home. So I got called in to do this because I'm the make things out of metal guy. Uh, and you know, it was it was an honor to be asked because it's obviously something that's really important in the ceremony, even more so than I initially realized. And my wife and I were invited to be a part of the ceremony, which if you've never been to a hidden new wedding, it's a it's a heck of a good time. It's a three-day party and it was it was fun. It was a really interesting thing to experience. So as far as the actual build, the metal we're using here is 24 ounce copper that means that a square foot of this sheet weighs 24 ounces and in my area they only come in three foot by ten foot pieces and as I had laid this pit out that basically meant I had two shots at it with absolutely no room for any error there was I mean just a couple square inches of extra space on the sheet when everything was said and done at almost $400 a sheet, I really did not want to mess this up, have to go get another sheet, deal with it again. So my initial approach was going to be that welding corners would be the easiest thing to do. So I designed it as a square step pyramid type of design. We've got the vertical pieces that are just rectangles and then the horizontal pieces are square donuts and then there's a little bowl up at the top. Those were cut out, cleaned up, and that cleaning process is much more manual than with steel because we're back to using clamps. Obviously copper, not magnetic. Can't use the magnetic grinding truck. So Tommy's here cleaning these up uh, just with a flap disc with like 60 grit on it. And you don't have to go too aggressive. We were gonna go through a pretty basic polish on this, so we really just did the edges but we did run a couple sample squares so I could practice and get the machine dialed in. Speaking of the machine, I'm of course using the HTP Pro Pulse 220 MTS, which has been my go-to for quite a while. It has a program in it with all the settings set up exactly the way you need for silicon bronze wire, which is what we're gonna be using for this. You know, there's not really a way to MIG weld copper, but we can MIG braze it with the silicon bronze wire. Uh, it's a very interesting process. It took me a little bit of getting used to. You know, of course, the machine has to be switched over. We're running pure argon, which the HTP Pro Pulse says in the screen. It'll tell you what kind of gas you need. And you just basically dial the machine to the thickness of the metal and start figuring it out. Uh, it didn't take too long to, to get it figured out. And, you know, it's, it, one real interesting thing, of course, is that you're gonna have a green weld because this is copper. You know, the, there's no camera tricks here. It, the light coming off the weld really is that green. Uh, and behind the hood, it looks interesting too. It's, it's just a, a whole different process and it was cool to learn on. Um, you know, you're, you're not really burning the, the metal away like you would with real thin stuff in steel and maybe that's just because it's a braze but it was an interesting process to be sure but after running these samples I just did not like what inside corners look like I, I just couldn't get a really nice clean weld on inside corners and I was gonna have a lot of them in this build so as much as it hurt to do it, I decided that I was gonna go back and recut all the pieces in effectively stepped triangles that we'd then bend into shape for the final assembly.
Now, as far as the actual plasma cutting of this copper, 24 ounce copper is just about the same thickness as 20 gauge steel. And I figured, let's start with those settings. They worked great. It was a pretty clean cut. I mean, just a little bit of kind of a, a bubbly or, or bead-like dross on the edge of the cut, something like what you get sometimes with stainless. And cleaned up real easy. Of course, copper's soft, so it's not gonna be a hard process to work. The, the actual bending was pretty simple. I have this cheap little Harbor Freight bending brake thing and I've used it a couple times over the couple years I've had it it's really just one of those process specific things that rarely comes out and for like 60 or 70 bucks it's not bad in this case you clamp down a piece of I guess it's like hardened tool steel uh, with some C clamps and that's your clamping mechanism it just so happens that that piece of tool steel is three inches wide. The two platforms of the brake are both three inches wide. And the steps of this construction were three inches tall and three inches wide. So not an intentional thing, but worked out beautifully. Zigzag your bends, so we're basically flipping each piece over and we have a little one inch lip at the bottom just to stiffen that bottom edge up. The last thing I wanted is to get everything put together and then have any heat that warps the plate or the sheet we want to make that bottom edge all wavy. So using a little bit of a, a lip there was a great idea. The process, again, zigzag back and forth, flipping the piece over very attentive to not mess this up because trying to straighten out a bend would suck and I was now out of copper so there was no room for mistakes but with each of the pieces bent we went back and just cleaned them up just a real simple wipe down with a little bit of acetone on a rag trying to get any junk off of them that we could and then Tommy and I debated the best way to kind of get this all held into place so I could tack it together and I don't know, is it is it a tack when you're MIG brazing? We're, we're gonna call them tacks and I'm gonna call them welds because I'll trip up if I try and remember. So we get all the pieces lined up with a couple blocks underneath to space them up at the right height. And then I just went to blue painter's tape to hold all the joints together. This, this was a really well laid out cut. Uh, I was a little nervous because you know, there's some room for error here, especially with the bending, but I wasn't off by much more than like a sixteenth anywhere, and you know, it was enough that I could flex everything back into place. The tape held everything into place. The, the whole idea here was put it together on the table, get a couple tacks on it, flip it over, and then get a bunch of tacks on the back side of this, kind of just to lock it together, so then I could go to working on the show face of course, I'm trying not to put any more weld or braze into the piece than I need to, but this was a new thing for me. Um, I got asked if I could weld, co weld something together out of copper. I said, yeah, I'm sure we can. I knew the machine had the capabilities and you know, I'm, I'll, I'll put the time in to try and figure something out. And uh, yeah, it worked out. Let's jump into the build. It's gonna be rough. So in all of my testing, I had found that doing outside corners downhill was a beautiful way to approach this. It was a pretty easy weld, raise, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, just like doing you know, inside corners downhill on square tubing. It's one of the easiest and prettiest welds. Same sort of approach here, worked real well. Didn't melt the material back. Uh, got 
you know, pretty good coverage onto both sides of the joint. So I attacked the corners that way, and then I was left with having to deal with the flat butt joint. And this was the thing in this entire project that really gave me a lot of trouble. If those two pieces were not dead level to each other, it was pretty difficult. In hindsight, what I really should have done was cut some little wedge-shaped backers or something like that and put those behind the joint so you'd have three pieces getting welded together that could reference each other, make it easier to get everything aligned right. It would have been the right thing to do. Didn't really come to my mind until I was basically done with the project, so that didn't happen. The thing I found to be the most efficient though was pointing my gun almost straight up and down and attacking that butt weld. You know, no push, no pull, just kind of straight up and down moving side to side. It, it seemed to work the best for not, um, for filling gaps and for not burning or melting away the material. It wasn't a super big thing like with steel on thin stuff, but it was something that happened enough that it was a problem, none of which was helped by... Oh, I'm moving to the wind. You go kill the door. I get questions from time to time about smoke and fume extraction and all that. We have these two 20 by 20 foot doors. There's one down here, one down that end of the building. They're pretty much always up, which is great for a gentle breeze. But when it gets too much, it blows my gas away, so we gotta close them. So we've done the outside corners. They're pretty simple. It's not a super complicated process. Like I said before, it's a lot like doing inside corners on square tube. It's really the welding gods handing you the best situation you can hope for. The weld just comes out pretty. Now what we're gonna focus in on are these butt welds. And I'm really gonna dive in on it here because I want you guys to see how much copper wants to move around. We're gonna look at it in regular time, then slow, and then we'll speed it up back to regular again and zoom in on it. This copper goes for a walk. These joints are three inch wide platforms, which means that angle is about four and a half inches long, and that weld goes for a walk at least three sixteenths of an inch. It's a lot, and I can't dial in on that enough. Let's compare it uh, with some static still shots to show you the before and after and what you're seeing here is less than a second apart. As a tack cools, the copper is going to contract quite a bit and it's going to move. It was a real bear on this to figure out how to get these butt joints to align. Basically, if the first couple tacks to hold the joint together weren't perfect, Everything about it after that was gonna just suck. Compare that again to a vertical joint under my uh, you know, arc shot lens. You can see how much easier that is. It doesn't move around at all. And that's because that joint is constrained in all three dimensions. The bends above and below it are preventing it from moving left to right or up and down and then just the geometry of the structure prevents the gap from opening or closing. Even when I get a perfect or near perfect joint on these uh, butt joints, they're, they're still gonna move. It's, it's a flat surface, which means it's only constrained in two dimensions. If we're gonna use the traditional coordinate plane, in X and Y, the steel or the copper can't really move because it's a flat plane. It's constrained. There's stuff attached to it in both dimensions. But the Z or the up and down as we're looking at it here can go for a walk, can do whatever the heck it feels like doing. It's it was difficult. I uh, copper was a total surprise to me. Steel moves a little bit up and down when you do this, but man, copper is just that times a thousand. The idea here was there's nothing I can do about it. It's it's gonna move. I wasn't prepared for how much it was gonna move, but it's going to move, which resulted in me flipping the piece over a lot to hammer everything back into place and then try and fill up any creases made from that hammering with more weld. It was super frustrating to get into this. It just, 
you were you were chasing a demon. You, it was at a certain point I had to decide this is good enough, which in my case was all right because uh, the family member of mine, this was four, had said they were looking for something a little bit more not rustic, but the way you'd find it back at home, the uh, a little less refined. This isn't something like a sign where every angle has to be super sharp. We were allowed to have a little bit of error in here, a little bit of um, hand working, and that was the only thing that made this tolerable. Then we jumped in after dealing with those butt welds, and, and frankly, I got to the point where I was pulling my hair out and I was almost ready to scrap this whole thing, build it out of 20 gauge steel and copper plate it. I mean, I was to the point where I had the chemicals on order to build a big enough bath that I can make one of these out of steel, know that I could get all those angles nice and sharp, and then copper plate the whole thing with a hell of a lot of copper. I had the scraps from the sheet. I mean, I was ready for it, but looking at this, this was... The ultimate product came out good enough that I was happy with it and you know the creator's curse right I saw every error in this and as soon as we delivered it everybody lost their mind they loved it it was I was a big hit at this event because I was the Havan Kun guy and I was the guy in the turban with a beard which none of the other guys were wearing other than the groom it was this was a really fun event it was a really fun project even though I was pulling my hair out through the whole thing. You'll see here as we get towards the end, uh, the grinding, there's not a whole lot of footage of because I was done. It was it was so much, every time I'd grind it I'd find a little pocket that if this was steel I'd, I'd put a couple tacks in, I'd grind it smooth again, make that pocket go away. But in copper you couldn't do that because you just chase the crease out of that pocket. It was super frustrating, but the ultimate project, or the ultimate product, was was something I was um, judgmental of, but really happy with. It, it felt like I had made something that matched up to the imagery I'd found online of what you'd find um, back in India, and you know, ultimately, it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the customer, or in this case, the recipient of this wedding gift wanted. And they were happy with it. I was happy with it. It was a very, very cool project to get to take part in. And, um, you know, I was, I was happy to see how it turned out. Now, I'm sure throughout this video, I've made mistakes on the terminology I used. I'm definitely not one of these social justice warrior folks, but I do respect other people's cultures. I think that cultural appropriation is an amazing thing. When we combine different cultures, take the best of all of them, we can build something together. And as a white mutt, you know, I'm French, German, Dutch, Irish, and English. I don't have a history that spans back in the recorded sense that all these other cultures do and it's a great thing to be a part of as much as we want to be you know pro red white and blue learning from other cultures is great having a part in it is um, you really walk away with something else you know I, I take this to heart a lot I actually did my language credits in college in Arabic because why should I pay a thousand dollars a semester or learn Spanish again? Let's learn something from a culture that spans back to literally the beginning of written history, you know? So I hope you guys got something from this. I hope you enjoyed the build. It was a, a really fun thing for me to do as much as at the time I was pulling my hair out. It was it was stressful, but you know, I've never mig brazed copper. I've soldered plenty. Uh, I'd never used silicon bronze wire before. I'd never plasma cut copper, and I'd never bent something as soft as this copper. And the sum total of the experience was a really fun build that was only capped off and made better by how much it was enjoyed by the people that received it. So until next time, guys, I hope you'll join up. You know, if, if you're new here, subscribe. We'll, we'll learn some new stuff together. Of course, there's always Patreon over there. We'll go through a full bid breakdown on how I'd sell one of these and how I did sell one of these. And, uh, yeah, until next time, a couple videos there. Thanks for stopping by.
Goodbye.